Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 139, Gaming Together Again, organizing community gaming events. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. With many of us starting to get back together and game in person again, I thought it'd be a good time to talk about organizing public play gaming events based on what's now the oldest question in our question pile. This discussion will be followed up by a look at the Wheel of Life expansion for Aventuria. And then we finish off with the Bellhops tabletop where I've got a number of games to talk about, including the Emergence of Shy Pluto expansions for Space Base, Trap Words, Guildmaster, and Flicking Finches. And I want this week to end. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We've got lots of feedback to get to today. Thanks to everyone who takes the time to comment and interact with our content. Not only does it provide us with feedback, but as far as social media goes, it helps get our content in front of the eyes of more people. Mm -hmm. And also, even if we don't read your feedback out on air or during the show, please realize that we do appreciate it either way. I do also try to reply to everything personally, regardless whether we bring it up here or not. Let's get started with a quick comment on our Master Taylor's Poltergeist demo kit for Aventuria review. John Daker Dacker writes, The English language Kickstarter hasn't been delivered yet. The pledge manager only closed a week ago. Ulysses printed some advanced copies in English, and I'm guessing you must have played one of those. So yeah, this expansion might or might not be made available through retail channel channels later on, but for the moment, even Kickstarter backers are still waiting. Well, thanks for the comment, John. Uh, I did think I had made it clear that the review copy that Ulysses Spiel, the German publisher, sent us uh, for the review in the review. Sorry, I thought I made it clear in the review that the Ulysses Spiel, the German publisher for the game, sent us copies of all this Adventuria stuff. And it was actually before the last Kickstarter even launched. So before they even had announced um, that Master Taylor's Poltergeist was even going to be out in English. So if that wasn't clear in the review, I do apologize. Now, I have been talking to my contacts there and have learned that Studio 2 is actually the company that is publishing everything Adventuria in North America right now. And that is going to include Master Taylor's Poltergeist. And it will be available here through them and through distribution because they are a publisher. Um, as you mentioned, John, though, they are still working to fulfill the last Kickstarter. It's only been a couple of weeks since that ended. There's still plenty of time. That stuff still has to get produced um, wherever it's getting made and put on boats and get shipped and all that fun stuff. And they are trying to get stuff out to the backers first, which I do appreciate. So Master's Taylor should be coming to retail. I just couldn't tell you exactly when, but it is coming eventually. Well, next, someone discovered one of our older reviews. Greg left this comment on our Big Trouble in Little China Legacy of Lopan expansion review. I agree with you. We tackled this with three players last night and steamrolled the enemies. Lopan didn't even get his enemy phase at the end of the game. We're going to try some house rules to try and ramp up the threat level. Keeping the Big Trouble cards, having one enemy activate after each player goes, like the D&D board games. Now, Sean actually played through this expansion with us at the time, and we all agreed that it did seem a little too easy. The problem was that it just didn't seem like anything we wanted to fix after playing through it. Like, it's it's kind of a one, especially low pans, pretty linear. Like, you may or may not skip over some sections. There were a couple sections we missed, but it just didn't seem like I wanted to fix it to play through again. I honestly have this one and the base game in a pile of stuff I plan to sell. Do you have any thoughts on this one? Well, I think the base game had some amusement value for real fans of the movie. That was about the best I can say about the whole game and its expansion. Mm -hmm. I would be hard-pressed to care enough to house rule that one. Though I suppose if I did own it, it might be, I might be determined to get my money's worth out of it. But, you know, if there was someone out there, else out there who wanted to pay me for it, it would, uh, it would be gone. Well, thanks for the comment, Greg, overall. Um, I'm a bit sad to hear that it's not just us, uh, but it's cool that you do have some fixes for it. And they do sound solid, I gotta admit. If I was going to sit down and play again, I would definitely consider trying those. 
uh, they are definitely worth a try for anyone else listening to. So if you did find it a little too easy, take a look at Greg's fixes, like having the enemies go at the end of everyone's turn and keeping the big trouble cards. I'd be tempted to keep the big trouble cards just because they made the game more interesting and fun. Next, we've got lots of love out there for Space Base based on our review, unboxing, and the current giveaway. Chris Groff says, great game. Jay Barons writes, one of my top five games I play every chance I get. Brian McDonald of Brains on Games commented, We like Space Base 2. We have the Shy Pluto expansion, but haven't played through all the additional stuff. And even AEG themselves took the time to comment, Thanks for this review. Happy to know you enjoy Space Base. Well, thanks everyone for the comments. I uh, mentioned it before. I love it when a publisher takes the time to check out our content. Uh, we are still loving this game. Uh, we've now actually cracked open Shy Pluto and have been digging into that legacy style expansion. I'll be sharing my spoiler free thoughts on that much later in the show. Next, we've actually got a reply to a comment from last week from Ed Healy, who noted that he wished Kickstarter was more about backing a dream in regards to our Battle of Gog review. Ralph Mazza contacted to say, I'll throw some money at Battle of Gog. It's the kind of project Kickstarter was really meant to be for. Excellent review information, by the way. I totally get backing a project just to help making someone's dream come true. Though I am sorry to say this particular project isn't looking good. Um, there's still eight days left at this point, and it's still only about a quarter of the way funded. Well, now let's dig into roll and move games. This one seemed to touch a nerve as we got a lot of feedback. These are just some of the highlights. First up, plenty of love for Merchant of Venus. For example, mm -hmm. Brad Hines writes, Merchant of Venus shows its age, but it's still a fantastic game. And Daniel Winter, Board Game Feast, commented, Merchant of Venus may be my favorite game, so it's mm -hmm. definitely possible to utilize that mechanic well. Phil Hatfield also included it, uh, in this comment, Yes, roll and move games can be very enjoyable. And you did well mentioning some of them. Formula D, Merchant of Venice, Camel Up. All of those are very enjoyable games with that mechanic. I would also put A Touch of Evil on my own personal list of good roll and move games. The theme alone propels this one to the fun and engaging category. Some don't like it in that game, saying it slows it down, but there are ways to mitigate slower movement. And if you roll a one, you automatically get an event card, which is always a helpful card in some way. So it's never a total loss moving the slowest. All right, let's stop there for a moment to address that last comment from Phil. So while doing my research for that episode, while looking up multiple lists of best roll and rights and roll and write geek lists on board game geek and so on, I saw a touch of evil on many top roll and write game lists. Had we done a typical honorable mention section, I would have thrown it in there. The reason it didn't make the main list, though, of course, is because I haven't had the pleasure of playing the game, and that's totally my fault. Because I am sorry to say the cosplay style art that Flying Frog uses on all of their horror games really turned me off. It, it looked unprofessional to me, and just like I see that, and I'm like, I don't want to try that game. And I actually think I missed out on some great games due to that. Though I know their games do have mixed reviews, but in particular, the Touch of Evil series is supposed to be really solid. And if anyone local's got a copy, once we start getting out and gaming in public again, I would love to give it a try. Well, next we have a comment from David Fox, who writes, Thunder Road was one of my favorite games as a kid, and I should have taken better care of it as a kid. Talisman of any version I love. Formula D I love, and honestly, would love to get to the table more. And I have the Ghostbusters reskin of ghost fighting treasure hunters and that game is rad well i gotta say this wasn't in our show notes because i just found out about it this afternoon at 3 p.m eastern i was able to attend a press conference from restoration games and david listen up thunder roads coming back restoration games is releasing a redo of thunder road i don't have it right in front of me it's like thunder road victories or thunder road vicious or thunder road if you go on twitter everyone's sharing stuff about it i've shared i shared a short video they shared with us but they are bringing back thunder road so i am really looking forward to that i'm sure david will be as well and that is thunder road vendetta and i knew in, there was a v thunder road vendetta <laughs> coming in 2022 to uh, Kickstarter in October. So watch for that one to hit. That one, I think, may be as big as Dark Tower for them. 
Now, finally, patron of the show, Jeff Seuss, left his comment on the YouTube discussion on Roll and Move games. Roll and move, when used pejoratively, mean, generally means you roll, move a token, make no interesting choices of your own, and do what the space you landed on says. Mm -hmm. If the situation isn't choiceless, it might use dice rolls to fuel movement, but it isn't categorized within the concept mm -hmm. of a roll and move as a pejorative term. You generally describe games with interesting choices to be made by some other mechanic besides roll and move, even if you're rolling dice and moving things. Well, thanks everyone for these great comments. Now, in regards to Jeff's comment, we ended up talking to him on our Discord channel. He is one of our patrons and found out that he left the comment before watching the entire video. So eventually we did get to a point where we pointed out there is definitely a difference between a roll and move mechanic in a game and a game that's considered a roll and move game. I do appreciate being called out, though I still got to say that I, everyone's still going to call uh, Talisman a roll and move, even though there are other parts of Talisman than just moving. Because you do have choice. You get to decide which way you go. And if you go across and if you use your axe, there are a surprising number of choices for a game that most people discredit for being roll and move. But still, I appreciate being called out. That keeps us on our toes. One final thing I want to highlight before we move on, and that is a wonderful five-star iTunes review left by Donna B. Focus on gaming experience makes this show unique. Lots of tabletop podcasts out there, but what I appreciate about Mo and Sean is their mission to improve your gaming experience. It's not just about reviews or interviews, although there are those. The hosts are dialed in on making sure you and your group have fun. They talk about matching games to the group and situation, organizing and hosting gaming in public, and avoiding or handling issues. An essential companion to the podcasts about design and mechanics because it puts those discussions in the context of real-world play cultures. Hosts are friendly and chatty, but very well prepared. They do their research and deliver lots of organized and useful info. Well, thanks so much for that review, Donna B. Uh, I love it because this shows we're doing a good job of fulfilling our mission statement of answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. That's why we're here, and it sounds like at least Donna thinks we're doing a good job. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Donna B. Now, this is also a good time to remind everyone, actually, that we do appreciate reviews like this left on platforms like Apple Podcasts or is it iTunes again or whatever, whatever Apple is calling it this week, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, whatever. Reviews left on these podcasts sites actually do help more people discover our content. So we greatly appreciate anyone who takes the time. Could be a written review or just click the stars. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of announcements before we move on to our main topic. All right, Mo's going to be out of coffee before the main topic, so that's a problem. So we might have to deal with that one. But also, our space-based giveaway is going strong and proving to be quite popular. We've got quite a few entries for this one. We're over at 250 entries, and it keeps going. For, uh, for this giveaway, offering up one sealed copy of Space Base. And again, I have to thank Brian Sheehan of the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society. Due to them, this giveaway is open worldwide. For you West Coasters or those willing to travel for some more gaming, Enfilade, Enfilade 2021 is coming up on Labor Day weekend. This is the premier historical miniatures convention on the West Coast hosted by the Northwest Historical Miniature Gaming Society in Olympia, Washington. Check out their whole webpage for more info. Thank you for entering, everyone, and good luck. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention tonight is that I was a guest on the Family Gamers podcast, specifically episode 251, which just dropped Monday when we record this. So a week, a day and a week before when this goes live, whatever. It was on Monday this week, uh, first week of July. Family Gamers is a great podcast and blog with a focus on gaming with the whole family. Uh, they end every episode by saying game with your kids. Every odd episode, they have a guest on the show because it's a, a husband and wife duo. And they say, for every odd episode, we want to have an odd number of people talking. And I thought that was cool. So I had the honor of being that guest on the last show. Now, we spent the first half of the show geeking about games and we've been playing in a bit of about sci-fi shows and found out that there are people out there that absolutely hate Avery Brooks. Um, 
we talked about a few things, got a little off track. Then they had a little featured review in the middle, and then they interviewed me about how we got started in the services we provide at Tabletop Bellhop. Well, you can find Family Gamers at www.thefamilygamers.com and all over social media as Family Games AA, all one word. Sorry, that should be Family Gamers. That's ah. me not being able to type. Family Gamers AA, Family? all one word. Oh, okay, there we go. That that was my bad. I apologize. Though I do want to thank Andra, Andrew and Anitra for having me on the show. We had a great time, and I offer to come back anytime they want. I would happily hang out with those folks. Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Now that we're starting to enter the final stages of the pandemic, at least in some parts of the world, and things are starting to open up in many areas, I figured it was probably time to go back to our question pile and grab all those questions that we kind of shoved under the rug because they were involving public play. Now, for the last year and a half, we've gotten a number of questions that I put on hold due to pretty much no one being able to get together and game in person. So tonight... We're bringing those out from the rug. We put them in a pile and we found the oldest question we have that we've had to put on hold. Tonight's question comes from Jennifer, who went to the blog and clicked on Ask the Bellhop to ask, My question involves organizing community events. A few months ago, I saw a local Barnes & Noble advertise a family game night. It ended up being the classic games like Clue, Monopoly, and the like. I was surprised since they do sell modern board games but it got me thinking about organizing a public event like that. Maybe approaching Barnes & Noble or having it out of the library. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for jumping into something like that? A little background on me, I run a small meetup group for board gaming families in Las Vegas. We do private game nights at my house every two weeks, so I am accustomed to meeting strangers and teaching them games, though my skill in both is debatable. Well, thank you so much for the question, Jennifer. And I do apologize for taking so long to get to your question, though I do think in this case, the delay is warranted. Now, I want to start off by saying that I think it's awesome. It is fantastic that you want to get involved in organizing public play events, bigger public play events. Gaming in public is by far the best and easiest way to spread this wonderful hobby across the world. And I applaud anyone willing to take the steps to organize and or help out with any type of community event. While I think many people think of Las Vegas as a tourist trap primarily, mm -hmm. I've known many residents there and think it's awesome to hear from Vegas locals. I actually <laughs> considered it as a place to move myself at one point when my company was opening up a location there. So I have a problem whenever I hear Las Vegas, I think of playing Settlers of Catan with my friend Eugene, who every time he builds a city on the desert has to sing, Viva Las Vegas, and then has to sing it every time again, whenever that city actually pays off because everyone makes fun of him for building on the desert. But I can't get that out of my head whenever I hear Las Vegas. Now, I'm also pleased to hear that you have a local Barnes & Noble that at least was doing something, right? They were hosting some kind of game night. Maybe it wasn't the games you wanted to see, but I'd rather see this than no gaming at all. The fact that they already have a place where people can gather together to play games is fantastic. I, I want that to spread. I want more places doing that. Now, this combined with the fact you already run a meetup group means, you know what, you're on the right track. You're, you're, you're a, a lap ahead, many people. Absolutely. And I bet in it's... Another person just like you, perhaps an employee there at Barnes & Noble, that set up that first one, and they'd probably love help or guidance, mm -hmm. and anything that brings foot traffic into stores like that is usually good for the store too, especially if you can highlight product on their shelves. So what I think I am going to do here, since you already gotten some progress, though, is take a step back. I want to talk about this because there are lots of other people listening besides Jennifer, and I want this to apply to someone just starting from scratch. I think this is going to be more beneficial to more people, plus some of the starter advice still may be useful to Jennifer as well. Indeed, you're never too experienced to pick up a few tricks for all those steps along the way. Now, for any community gaming event, you are going to need three things at an absolute minimum. There are also some great nights to haves, but we're gonna start with the basics. For a public play event to work, you need a place to play, games to play, and people to show up at that place to play those games. Pretty much everything else is icing on the cake once you have those three basics down. Now, I did cover 
some of this and aspects of this back on episode 51 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, that was entitled Join the Club, and there was a related blog post called Tips for Starting Your Own Tabletop Gaming Club. Now, that was almost two years ago, so I do think it's worth looking at this topic again, and even comparing what kind of came out of my train of thought while working on the show notes, it's actually a slightly different approach to the whole topic as last time. But if you do want even more information than you hear tonight, feel free to go check out our back catalog or the blog for that post. The first thing you'll need is a place to play. So Jennifer said they're having strangers at their house, and to me, that's a big no-no. Like, I, I honestly think the first thing you should do is drop and forget right away about playing games at your own house. Like, I don't care if you got a nice garage out back that you can fit four by eight gaming tables and fit four of them in there and hold 30 gamers in there. Save that for the people you know and trust, your own personal gaming group, perhaps people you've met at community gaming events and have gamed with multiple times and have grown to know. Please do not open your own home to the public. I, like, I love that someone's trusting enough to do that, but there are many reasons for this, including liability issues, bylaws, zoning laws, and fire codes. Then there's the potential people problems, which I don't think we really need to get into here, but I'm sure you can imagine the types of people that might show up to an event that you would want there. Public spaces, especially retail, commercial, and restaurants, have insurance for things that homeowners do not and for good reason. You want your community event to be at a public place, a place the community can gather. Also, public places are generally going to be more central, which helps a wider range of people get there mm -hmm. or even just stumble upon it and discover it. Now, when looking for a public place, uh, you want a spot that's well-lit, accessible. Please be aware that there are people who have mobility issues make sure there's ramps, elevators, all that stuff. Has public washrooms. If you're going to be there for an extended period of time, people might need a bio break. There should be a space to play. Like I've had people book places, gaming nights at places and you show up and there's like a standing room only. And it's, it's like, there's no all bar seats and no tables. And you, you need to watch to make sure you actually have tables that are large enough to game at and chairs to sit in. You also want somewhere that you can either bring food in and drink in or that provides food and drink in some way. Now, this can be really simple. This could be bottled water, chips, chocolate bars, and snack food, but it does help to have at least something to keep people hydrated and while not hungry. You don't want people to have to leave your event to go get food to then maybe decide they don't feel like coming back. Also take th into consideration things like the venue having parking and or being on a public transit route. This could greatly impact your attendance. The easier your venue is to get to, the more people you may get out. Now, I happen to know that at least pre-pandemic, all three of those major Barnes & Noble locations in the Vegas area had Starbucks in them. So that yep. will certainly help with the munchies, hydration, and public restrooms. There you go. Maybe all set. Now, because there is a Barnes & Noble already there hosting a game night, that does seem like a great venue. I, at Barnes & Noble's bookstores are great. Anywhere that sells games is a great choice because you end up with a win-win relationship with the venue. You get a place to host game nights and play games, which hopefully leads to sales for the venue. So bookstores, hobby stores, game stores, they can all be great for public play events. Now, Jennifer also mentions libraries, which I think are a fantastic venue for board gaming, as long as they have a space for it that's out of the way enough that potentially loud gamers won't bother anyone trying to do research and you won't have people coming through that you don't need coming through. I do know like people like Donald Dennis, who's on board games, our walls feel all over the internet is a works for a library and he runs their game nights. Like, so though it does exist and it is out there. So it is definitely worth reaching out to a library. Uh, and a quick Google suggests that Las Vegas libraries are actually quite sizable with free Wi-Fi though they do rent their meeting spaces. So you need to speak with someone there to see how about organize, how to go about organizing public events and uh, if there are charges associated with that. Very true. Now, I've also personally hosted events at cafes, pubs, and restaurants. The thing to watch here is a couple things. One is the lighting. You don't want to be playing Euro games, especially your card games in somewhere with low light. Uh, you can probably get away with a deck of cards, but anytime you're going to be reading anything or having to see symbols on a board, you want bright lights. The other thing is volume level. 
Now that goes both ways. Most games require concentration, so you don't want to play anywhere too loud. Similarly, some games and gamers can be quite loud themselves, and you don't want to disrupt anything else going on in the venue. So for this reason, you're better if you can to get a dedicated space to gaming instead of sharing a pub with a bunch of people who are going to be there for drinks and food at the same time that you're using up some of the tables to play games. Note that may not be possible. Note casinos, for instance, aren't ideal for board gaming, at least not in their public areas. Yeah, though I do know they do have meeting rooms as well, though I've never considered running an event at the local casino, but I could see it working. The problem with the casino is then you're limiting it to 18 plus or I think even higher in the States, which you don't want to do if you don't have to. And I just unplug again for potential edit. I don't know why I keep rolling over that cable this week and not other weeks. This is how our night started. <clears throat> All right. Another place I found great for hosting game nights are banquet halls and community clubs, things like the Knights of Columbus or the local Legion or various culture clubs like the French Canadian Club or whatever you may have in your area. Now, these venues tend to have large tables for banquets, and they're usually not being used every day on a day to day basis or so often very open to having an event that will bring people in during their usual downtime. Now, the one problem I have had with these places that now and then they do get booked for a big event, and that often means the game club needs to get out of the way. You get you get shoved aside. We had that problem with people having midweek weddings at one of our local venues. The other thing you do have to watch for with this is how exclusive these groups are. You want to have your public play event in a place that is welcoming to gamers of all ages, walks of life, and social status. Some of these private clubs can be more welcoming than others, and I'll just leave it at that, but we have had this problem locally. Another issue is that while in a post-pandemic world, there may be places desperate to do anything to bring people in, and as such, very welcoming to gamers, but mm -hmm. once business picks up again, they may be all too happy to turf the gamers for those they see as more profitable. Now, one trick to that is just make sure that the gamers that are with you do actually support the venue and make it so it's profitable for you to be there. Now, as for actually booking a venue, right, like doing the work, it generally just means talking to the right person. Uh, make sure you talk to a manager, not just a person on staff, and sell the idea to them. Let the venue know how many people you expect. This is where things like Meetup and Facebook events are good for getting a, a rough idea of how many people will be attending and what you expect them to get out of it. So if your gamers are coming, are they going to spend money and what are they going to spend money on? Like if it's a restaurant, are you going to make it a long enough event where you expect everyone to show up and eat dinner first and then move on to gaming? Or is it just going to be the case of people ordering apps while they play? Keep the food and game separate. We've talked about this many times. Side tables. Now, if a game store offer, offers to have an event, are they going to offer their game library? Do they have demo games? Do they have specific games they want to sell so that you can highlight those games? Or will they? are they willing to run demos? Like here, I'll host an event, but if you want to show off some games, you're welcome to you know use our people to show off your games. Now, for a cafe, we have had this before as a drink minimum where people have to buy whatever, one coffee every couple hours, or they have to at least buy something for a set amount of time. Now, one of the deals I made in the past that actually worked really well is there was a place that basically charged me a deposit. I gave them a set amount of money at the beginning of the event, but if people, the gamers, spent enough money, I got that back. I never lost my deposit. Every time people spent enough money. And I thought that was a good, but they, they want to minimize their risk, right? They don't want a bunch of people using up their tables for four to six hours and getting nothing out of it. Now, another thing you can do is charge people to attend the event. And then you could take some or all of those proceeds and give it to the venue. This is going to work better for a place that doesn't have any food to offer or anything they're trying to sell. Now, if you do have an agreement like this, make sure the gamers know, make sure people know that, hey, support the venue. That I say this every time I'm talking about public play events. Support the venue. Make sure people are spending money and not sneaking in their own drinks and not being cheap. And remind people that, like, hey, we're gathered together. We're providing games. This is a service that is valuable to you, so please pay it back. So make sure they know that. I've got to say, over the years, i found most places. I'm more than happy to have a bunch of gamers there, especially if they have a slow day. And a game night can fill that gap. 
like some of the biggest events in Canada actually happen at Boston Pizzas. That's not something we do here locally, but Ottawa is filled with these Boston Pizza gaming events that are midweek when Boston Pizza is not busy. All right. Well, something I really recommend, as well as meeting in person, uh, which helps making sure you're talking to someone who actually can make mm. such decisions, like the manager, and not just a friendly employee, <laughs> but also follow up by email. Get mm -hmm. an agreement in writing. It may or may not have any value in a legal sense, but it can help clarify and remind people involved, as yeah. well as potentially spot any gotchas you had missed in your discussions. Yeah, I've always negotiated in good faith, and in all the years I've done this, we have had one problem with a venue come up that, that didn't uphold their end of the bargain. So we just don't go there anymore. Now, one thing you do need to consider that's like a sit down either by yourself or if you're doing this with someone else, have this discussion, is if you are going to be at a venue that allows adult beverages, you basically can't really stop people from ordering adult beverages if you're at like a restaurant that serves them. Um, and if adult beverage will be allowed at the event. This is a personal choice. Um, what you need to be aware of is at least in Canada, and I don't know if this is true everywhere else, if you are hosting an event and someone has too much to drink and then causes a problem, uh, you're liable because it was your event, not the venue, you, the organizer of the event is liable. So as a big one, so you need to, to deal with that. You need to be aware of that. And you have to worry about people driving vehicles and stuff like that. Then you also have to deal with people who may not be able to handle their drinks and people who get rowdy and everything else that comes with it. So you're looking at two very different types of events if you allow drinking and you just need to make that decision. Now, one of the things I found worked really well locally for not having to worry about that is having your events at like noon, early in the afternoon at a public play place because in most cases people aren't getting hammered at noon, but it is still something that could happen. So this is a, a, a big thing that could impact your choice of venue. Now, if you are going to have adult beverages, I actually recommend looking into your region's alcohol server training, just so you're aware of what to look out for and some guidance on dealing with those who may be overdoing it. In mm -hmm. Ontario, it's called Smart Serve, but that will vary by jurisdiction. And what it is, it's just a training to understand how to recognize people who are over and by being and things. It's meant for servers, but it's really beneficial for organizers as well. So now that you found a place, you're going to need games to play. Now, if you're playing at a game store or cafe or Barnes & Noble who happens to sell games, maybe you're lucky enough to have demo copies on hand. But in most cases and for most places, you're going to have to bring the games or someone's going to have to bring the games. While it's possible you can rely on others to provide games as the host for a public play event, I strongly recommend building up a small library at least of games on hand that you bring to every event. Now, for every public play event, you want a mix of games and game types, both in regards to weight and player count, as well as familiarity, stuff people will recognize. I really do recommend having some of those mass market favorites on hand. And, of course, some well-known gateway hobby games to try to shift people towards the hobby side of things. Because as hobby gamers, which you wouldn't be listening to me right now if you weren't a hobby gamer, we tend to forget that board game night to many people means something very different than it does for us. People who happen to see an ad in the paper or walk by a store that says game night are looking for a night out to have some fun and play something simple, lightweight and party games. The kind of games we talked about last week during our topic of ultra light games or a couple weeks back when we talked about filler games. They're looking for light laughing fun, not necessarily sitting there trying to do a spreadsheet in their head and figure out which stocks they should buy in an 18xx game. Though you may get those gamers too. Yeah, having Clue or something people instantly recognize mm -hmm. can really make them feel more comfortable uh, if they're not used to hobby games. And then once they're comfortable, that's when you can get them interested and lure them in over to the mm -hmm. expensive side. So the most popular gaming cafe, as far as I know, in the world is Snakes and Lattes in Toronto that is now spread out to like three other countries. It's, it's kind of bananas how far they've gotten with this. And the one thing the owner quickly learned and used to point out all the time is that their most popular games are still, you know, Monopoly, Clue, Jenga, and other social games. The, these are big, heavy gamers that hire people just to teach games to other people, and constantly people come in and are looking to play mass market favorites. 
that is what you're going to get at a public gaming event. To me, it's an opportunity. Blow their minds, show them something new, but have those games they're comfortable with there. Like, I'm not saying avoid hobby games altogether, right? Like, please, please spread the love of Euro games with the world. But just make sure you have some of the lighter stuff. Like, at our personal events, the most played game at our events we host downtown over the years has been Guess Who? It's just a matter of having it out on the table. People who aren't really comfortable and don't know anyone else are going to pick it up and play it between themselves. And then as they see other people having fun, hopefully they get to mingle. Sometimes they just sit there all night and play guess who, and then come back a couple of weeks later and try something different. Like, honestly, these are events I run with most, a bunch of local gamers. Guess who's the most played games. Speaking of which, you should also base the games on the venue. Where guess who is most popular is a place called Villains Bistro, which is a geeky, cafe and bar it, it's a, a a bistro right um guess who was huge there i don't bring guess who to the local game store what you're bringing should be based on the venue if you're playing in a dedicated gaming area you also have to watch for things like table size and you might want to avoid games with lots of little components that are easily lost the games i bring to a pub like villains bistro are very different from the games i would bring to a dedicated gaming space now if you are playing at a bookstore for instance use their terms Maybe it's family strategy games rather than hobby games. Mm. Retail locations will love you for anything you can do to help move their product. And if people come in to buy a paperback, play a few games and walk out with a copy of Team of Tokyo, mm -hmm. everybody wins. Totally agree. Now, another thing you do have to watch for is the tone of the games you are bringing. Uh, personally, I not only refuse to bring any of the popular not safe for work board games to any event I'm hosting, I also ban anyone else bringing them. You don't want anyone playing anything that may offend someone else. And I'm not talking countercultural, easily offended people. I'm talking about making game night fun and not saying something inappropriate well to someone else who happens to be playing or just at the venue. You got to think about the fact that you're not just gamers there at some of these places. There could be kids present. There will be diverse people around. Them. Similarly, you probably want to avoid games with controversial themes. You and everyone else is welcome to enjoy these games in the privacy of your own homes. I'm not judging you there. But there are plenty of other games to play that are much better for public play gaming events. Yeah, in this case, even if they do sell those games at the store and Barnes & Noble does carry mm -hmm. Cards Against Humanity, just because they sell it doesn't mean they or anyone else wants it played at the store. Now, once you have a number of games ready for events, perhaps even a core set of games you always bring, that's when you can start encouraging other people to bring games. At all of the gaming events I run, I call them open gaming events. I welcome anyone to bring the games they want. And, well, all, not all of them because of those games I just mentioned. But bring most of the games they want. And the more people that bring games, the more options there are. And what I have found is most of the people willing to bring games are excited about the games they're bringing and willing to teach them and excited to share them with other people. So they take a load off you by being ambassadors of their own and teaching the games. Yeah. That being said, if a bookstore didn't want people bringing in games, True. it would also be understandable. If things get busy, it's unfortunately all too easy to strip the shrink off a box on the shelf and add it to your collection. Should someone choose to ruin it for everyone. You're giving people ideas here. That's not good. No, but it's true. That, that uh, I am assuming they're good with you bringing games. Now, if a local game store is letting you have an event and only lets you play with their demo games or Barnes & Nobles has a bunch of game night copies, um, all I would do is try to encourage them to have enough variety in those games. And I honestly would probably look for, excuse me, honestly, I would probably look for another venue eventually if they were that sticky about it. So now that you got a place and games, you need people. Now, Jennifer noted they already run meetups. So that is a great place to find gamers. Though I personally found the service a little limited as a free app, the paid version, um, you need it early in your, your, once your group grows past a certain size, you pretty much have to go for the paid version. Now, if you are charging for your game night, maybe that can offset that cost. But personally, it's something I haven't used. Uh, Facebook events are great for finding adult gamers. No, kids are not on Facebook, despite what you may think. Um, Board Game Geek is a great place to find gamers. If you are looking for other alpha gamers, only really alpha gamers are going to be on Board Game Geek. People are already, you have, a, you have a vested audience there, right? And they have a forum for every state and every province 
possibly even broken down by city, depending on where you are. For us in Windsor, Ontario, we're stuck with the Ontario Forum. But once I start running events, I post in there every event we're going to have and have met some awesome local gamers through Board Game Geek. Now, if your event's free, the other thing you do is reach out to local media, newspapers, bloggers. Um, there, are, there are so many Windsor news sites now run by independents. Reach out to all those people and be like, hey, and look, a lot of those online ones have event sections where you can submit local events and community calendars. Now, some of those will charge money, but usually if your event is free, they don't. So that's why I suggest if you have a free event doing this. This is a great way to get the word out. Now, as for sending an official press release, which is also something worth doing, this is worth doing if you have a new event that started up or if you have a big event, like if we talked a few weeks ago about um, running board game tournaments or something like our Extra Life 24-hour charity gaming. That is the kind of thing where we might actually send out a press release. We'll go on the news. I've been on TV before talking about it. Now, it's old school, but something that actually we found works rather well is putting up posters and flyers. Uh, both at the venue you're going to be using, but also at places gamers like to hang out. Game stores, comic shops, coffee shops, the local university. You can also look to put up something online. If you are playing at a specific venue and they have a web page, ask them to list your event there. Now, once things get started, word of mouth will probably be your best way to get the word out. And while the goal of that is just make sure it's a fun game night. There are many meeting group planner websites and software out there. We couldn't possibly cover mm -hmm. them all. But as a local, you're probably already aware of what is in use in your region already. Mm -hmm. And it's best to work with what's already established than to try and get people to use a new platform, which they are generally hesitant to uh, sign up with. And these new platforms show up every week. I can't believe how many apps are out there now to find gamers. And I'm like, go to the place people are already using, right? <laughs> Try to find what's most popular. So now we got the basics. We got a place, we got gamers. We're filling that people with, play, with, with, with people to play the games. So here are some further tips and things you want to have in place. Maybe not for your first event, but these are the kind of things you want to get in place as soon as you can. These are things that are going to make the game night fun or more fun. And this is the kind of thing where that word of mouth is going to spread. You're going to get people excited about your events. There are uh, <clears throat> the icing on the cake, a game night, uh, the icing on the game night cake, as it were. Sean got distracted. All right, so I'm talking about fun and excitement. This really isn't a fun and exciting thing to talk about, but it's something important. If you run a local event, a public event, you should have a harassment policy and communicate it well. Have this posted somewhere. Have a copy on each table. Have it posted online. Have a sign-in sheet at the start of the event. Everyone's going to get a copy. Make sure everyone knows it and has read it, perhaps even getting people to sign it to show that they've read and agreed to it. While this may seem over the top, harassment policies do the opposite of what people think. We're not trying to exclude people. They actually make your game nights more accessible, more open, and more safe. They let people know that your event will be a safe place and what to do if it becomes unsafe for them. With this, you can and should also provide safety tools. Have an open door policy. What that means is if anyone is uncomfortable, they can get up and walk away from the table for any reason. Make sure any games that need them include tools like the X card. Now, yes, this is generally an RPG-based tool, and we've already said avoid the controversial games, but this can apply to some board games as well as role-playing games. Remember, this is all about getting together and having fun, and you want to stomp out anything that could ruin this fun for anyone else. Now, aside from rules about interpersonal issues, depending on your location, there could also be an additional set of rules specifically about the staff and product. Mm -hmm. If you're in a store, restaurant, or even library, if the store is providing demo copies of games, for instance, people need to know they can't just grab one off the shelf and open it up to play mm -hmm. if someone is using the, the demo copy. It sounds like something rid ridiculous, but it pays to anticipate just how ridiculous some people can be. Now, along with this, you should have some general ground rules as well. It shouldn't all just be about the th things that could go wrong. Like who's going to bring the games? Um, indicate who, who puts it away. Who puts away a game at the end of playing with it? And make sure everyone knows to put it back the way you found it. I hate when I blend my games out and I bring them home and I go to play and there's all the baggies are there and all the dividers are there, but everything's just dumped in the box. Please take care of other people's games. Uh, you should have rules for food and drink. 
Again, I say keep them separate. Eating, drinking away from the games, especially when you're playing someone else's games, remove the possibility of spills or greasy fingers completely if you can. Drinks on side tables, separate tables, or have an eating area that's separate from the playing area. Now, this isn't a tournament or anything. Well, I guess it could be, but in general, for a, for a general public play thing. So you don't need, like, a group-wide start player rule, though maybe you want one. You just want to cover common things that are come up on game night. Who's responsible for cleaning up? Where do the games go? How do you indicate who owns what game so someone doesn't take the wrong thing? What happens if someone actually damages someone else's game and so on? Now, this could be an ephemeral social contract, but I honestly think this should be right there with your harassment policy and written down somewhere, like at least posted online. If you're using some kind of event service, have it in the description of the event. You want it so these are easily communicated to someone showing up for the first time as well. And no, these should be living and change over time. As new things come up and the group grows, you're going to find you need to add some rules in and maybe some take out, take some out. A simple sign-in sheet that has the rules right there to be read and agreed to is also a good way to help if you need to enforce them and possibly build up a contact list for future events. It's true. Now, I am assuming Jennifer wants to host these nights and be involved in it through the whole night. You need someone to do that. It doesn't necessarily need to be the person who started everything. And I get it. The main goal of building a public play event is to get together and play games. Someone at the event, though, should also be playing host, perhaps instead of playing games, just playing host. This person should greet everyone who arrives, explain what the group rules are, again, including that harassment policy, and work with people to facilitate games getting played. If people show up while all everyone else is already playing something, maybe you have a system where you set them up with a solo or low player count game to play until other tables open up. Watching for games ending soon, encouraging people to swap things up and game with other people. One of the big advantages of being at a public play event is to play with different people. If there's a group that plays together by themselves all the time, now don't bug them every week. If that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. But do encourage people to mix it up. You also will have to have someone that's willing to deal with all the issues that come up, which is very important to work with the venue. You don't want to overstep anyone's bounds. Uh, there are definitely like certain people are allowed to do certain things in different establishments. Uh, this also goes for setting up the venue, something that's not in the notes here that I want to throw in. Don't just start moving tables. Ask. It may be a liability issue. They may need to get their own staff to move tables, stuff like that. Don't rearrange the whole place without permission. Um, that's one of the things. You also, as, as the host, should be trying to make sure people are having fun and answering any questions. Now, personally, I tend to mix this with gaming. But what I always do is make sure the people I'm sitting down to play with know that I'm hosting primarily. I am here to host this event, and I might have to get up and pause the game to greet someone or facilitate a new game or even sit down and teach a game. Now, as your game group grows and you get a number of regulars, hopefully you can start sharing this hosting duty, perhaps having different people responsible for different things or rotating who plays host each time. Always know who your venue contact is in case of problems. You don't want to try and deal with a problem and not know who you're supposed to be talking to right then. The manager that you agreed with all, uh, all, on everything with might not be there that night. Yeah. Now, as for getting people gaming together, there are some tools you can use to help facilitate this. These are things that I did not have when I started off with my public play events that I've learned from various cons that I've gone to. So one of them is to have a list of all the games present whether it's in a binder or whatever, or have a central area where people know to find the games they can play. Now, with that, you also do have to get the permission of people who brought games to put their games in a central area. Some people would want to hoard them themselves, and that's where a list can be even better. Just then make sure the list includes who to talk to if someone wants to play those games. Now, another is some way to indicate a couple things. So one is a group or person is looking for more players. So I've got this game. It's a four-player game. I want to play it. How do I let the group know I need people to play without disrupting everyone? Also, hey, I really want to try this game, but I don't know what I need someone to teach a game. Those are two core ones. 
Now, this can be done with signs. I've seen some really great table signs that have been done for that that just say looking for player, looking for teacher. Um, personally, I haven't gotten that far locally because our events aren't quite that big, but I've used small traffic cones. And what it is is if you're looking for players, you put a traffic cone on your table while you're setting up the game and flipping through the rules, and that indicates to people that they need to come over. Now, there is a bit of a learning curve here because it took forever to get people to start putting the cones off the table once they started playing, but it's just something you should do. Uh, the other one that I saw, and I had never seen this until going to Queen City Conquest, is people will grab a game they want to play, put it above their head, and walk around the room. I learned that that means, hey, I'm looking for people to play this game. And I'm like, you know what? That's a really good non-visual, well, sorry, visual, non-verbal cue that works really well. Now, I have been to events that go, hey, this game's starting in half an hour. Do you want players? Depending on your venue, that might work as well. When we have a smaller group together, like 10, 12 people, I'll usually do that. Or I'll just go ask people like, hey, your game's wrapping up. We're about to start a game of this. Anyone want to get in on that before we start? So just have some way to communicate. I want to play something. I need more people. I need to teach. Those are the big ones. Yeah, whatever you choose, this can be something else you put a little guide to at sign-in. Yeah. Need a player? Cone on head. Need a game? Red clown nose. Okay, maybe not those specifically, but something established as uh, as a standard. There you go. Everyone who's not playing has clown noses. Well, I get the like blinking Rudolph one, so it's really obvious. Like you, you're not playing anything. Yeah, getting people to do that. Maybe at one of those drinking events, you can get away with that one. Now, another thing you really would like to have, uh, it's, it's not necessary, but it will really help, is to have people on hand who are skilled at teaching games. This is a huge bonus for game night. I know people who go out to public play game nights to learn to play games they bought themselves that they don't want to take the time to learn to play. This is their the main thing they get out of coming to my gaming nights is to have someone teach them to play a game so they can go home and play it on their own. Now, Jennifer noted they have some experience in this, and it is something you will get better at over time. We have multiple episodes on teaching games. Feel free to go back to the back catalog. There's so many, I'm not even going to call them all out. The more game teachers you have, though, the better. Now, to help with this, I strongly suggest finding teaching guides and game summaries off places like Board Game Geek and Esoteric Order of Gamers. I find these online, print them off, and then place them into the box for any games and bring out to public play events. That way, even if I can't teach the game myself, there's a tool right there in the box to help someone else learn the game. Now, we live in the future, as far as I'm concerned, and there is awesome stuff out there as long as you have internet and nowadays who doesn't have a cell phone someone at the game table probably has a cell phone and there is a great way to bring up watch it played gaming rules rattle runs through or your favorite board game teacher as long as someone has a cell phone there's always someone on hand to teach the game that is something we did not have when i started this in 2002 and it's a great resource though i find people forget they don't think of it. So like people, I, I've been at a, a board game blitz tournament and people are like, we're waiting for you to teach game. I'm like, why don't you just bring up a Rado? They're like, oh, great. Yeah. So that way they just put it out. One person happened to have a tablet in their bag and they all sat and watched it. It was great. Now, as well as teaching, a little sheet detailing everything that should be in the box and perhaps where, if it's some sort of form of organization, is helpful when it's over and people are putting things away. And of course, we've already figured out who's putting it away, right? We agreed to that. Yes, that was one of the agreements. There are some great rules out there for who's putting away the game. I got to say, I, I particularly personally in a public play event, I think everyone who's playing should work together to do so. You should all help baggy and put everything away. If you're not sure how to put a game away, find out who the owner is and ask. Don't just guess. Um, but I also really like the rule that the loser puts the game away or the opposite, the winner. So yeah, you won. You're awesome. But you get to put the game away. So I, I do like both of those. Where did I go? Got that. So as your club grows, it can also be advantageous to have a game library, like a game club. Like I, I told you, this is kind of based on my like you want public play events. You want a, a set of games for that group of people, some form of central resource of games that players can borrow games from. Now, this could be just for use on game nights, because I'm assuming game nights are regular, right? They're, they're once a week, once a month, or whatever. But this could also stretch to be a resource that's available for people to use on off nights. Now, if possible, you want this to be hosted at the venue. This is for a number of reasons, including the fact that a game collection can take up a lot of space. So someone has to have the room to do it. The fact that if it's in a central place, no one's going to argue about who gets to host it. 
and the fact that if the person who owns the collection can't show up, what do you do? If you're charging people to attend your event, growing a collection is a great way to spend that money and reinvest it into, into this public play event. The other option is if you don't can't keep it at the venue, consider splitting up the, the, the collection among multiple members. Again, to make it seem more fair. And second, so that if, again, one member can't make it, someone else can still bring their part of the collection. Also, while there is a wealth of gaming stores around, not all have the ability to have gaming in store. You might even be able to partner with a game store at mm -hmm. a separate venue and let them supply, store, maintain demo games. Now, while I already mentioned that I make sure to keep all of my game nights as open game nights, that way people are always welcome to bring and show off the new hotness, right? What they're excited about. I, I don't want to shut that down. I don't want to shut down some other gamers' excitement that they just got this game, they want to share it. I still like to have a theme for every one of our game nights. What this does is it helps people focus on what games to bring for those of us that do have a collection. So it's like, all right, I have too many games to pick from. I don't know what to bring tonight. Where if I go, we're going to do pirate games, I can go, well, I only own 10 pirate games. I can only fit about three of them in this box. What three pirate games are there? That's just easy. The other thing it can do is it can help drum up excitement for the event. So it's not just every game night's the same. It's open gaming. People have no idea what to expect. They're going to go in and they're like, oh, yeah, there'll be the stuff from the game store. And Steve will bring this and John will bring this. And then I don't know what Mo will bring. You know what? Let's skip it this week. There's, there's nothing. We're not going to miss anything. Whereas having a theme, people tend to get more invested. Like, I'm not going out to play games. I'm going out to play a new pirate theme game, and I'm going to get dressed up, and I'm, I'm going to wear an eye patch while I play. It honestly does really help keep people invested by giving people a reason to come to that night, not just come to every night. And of course, you can try to work with your venue to match up. Barnes & Noble, perhaps they do a product display to match your theme. Mm. Maybe a restaurant could even have a special that night, even if it's actually just their usual special with a fun <laughs> theme name the servers know. That's a cool idea, actually. Do you see that at game cons? If you if you go to um, Barley's, which is a, a I don't know, brew pub, I guess, uh, that's right near the convention center in, at Origins, they have two menus. They have the Origins menu and the regular menu, and they're actually identical, but everything has fantasy names. All right, my final suggestion, and to be honest, this is a, a strong, probably the strongest suggestion. This is, you, you're probably stuck at the beginning, but this is one of the quickest things you want to do. You don't want to do it all yourself. This is the trap I fell into early in the Windsor Gaming Resource days. Once you have some regulars at your game night, talk to them and see if they're willing to volunteer to help out in some way. Well, it's admirable and appreciated that Jennifer and others like them want to start hosting a gaming night. They shouldn't have to do it all on their own. Just because someone starts something doesn't mean they have to be the only one doing it forever. Similarly, if you're in a game club or you attend public play events, I encourage you to offer to help out. Now, this can come in all kinds of forms. Maybe someone's online all the time, so they can run a group social media account, to keep everyone aware, and maybe drum up interest. Someone may have a huge game collection, so they become in charge of bringing the core games every night or maybe setting the theme. Someone who's active on Board Game Geek can be in charge of posting there, getting into the local group and posting once a week. Or they could set up the... Uh, private forum or a blog on board game geek to get the words out if you've got a student in your group someone who attends a local college or university maybe they can help finding new gamers by putting the word out on campus if you've got a baker in the group maybe there's someone willing to make snacks for everyone every week possibly even turning this into a side hustle and selling cupcakes at your game night we gamers are a talented lot use that use that to your advantage and benefit and benefit everyone who takes part in your community gaming event. Make your community gaming event a community event. Now, one thing I know about Las Vegas is that there are a lot of event professionals based there. Mm -hmm. Folks who know a lot about organizing things. Now, they may not want to take on a big job on their time off, but they might be willing to help here and there and offer their advice and knowledge mm -hmm. to benefit your events. Well, that's it for our discussion on starting up and organizing a community gaming event. 
Now remember, if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our review of Aventuria Wheel of Life, an expansion for the Aventuria adventure card game. Thanks to Ulysses Spiel for providing us with a ton of Aventuria content to check out, including this expansion. Aventuria Wheel of Life was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zach, two names I've been saying a lot because they're on every Aventuria product, as far as I can tell. It features artwork by Nadine Sacco, again, same name as on the corset. It was published by Ulysses Spiel in 2019 and is being distributed in North America by Studio 2 Publishing. This is an expansion for the Aventuria Adventure card game and does require the core box to be of any use. This expansion has a MSRP in North America of $24.95 US dollars. Now, Wheel of Life is more of an accessory for fans of Aventuria rather than an expansion. Though there is one small addition to the game in the form of the Dragon Token. Now, the main thing you are getting in this box, though, are 11 wheel-style health counters and hero tokens featuring new artwork. You can see these life counters and tokens in our Wheel of Life unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the contents of this box are pretty much exactly what you'd expect from that description. A very small two-sided sheet of rules and assembly instructions, a bunch of punch boards, and a baggie holding plastic screws for holding the wheels together. Punch boards contain 11 two-part life counters, and there are also punch boards with a number of character counters and the dragon counter. And these were really well punched, mm. literally falling out as you lifted the boards at times. Yes. Actually, I had a hard time keeping it in the box because everything had fallen apart. I ended up having to punch it all just to reseal the box at the end of the unboxing video. Now, of note here is the fact that connectors for these life counters are screws and can be undone once you've assembled your light counters. Something you're not gonna be used to if you're like, you play X-Wing or Fantasy Flight games where they snap together and they don't come apart. Now, the reason you want to take them apart is the fact that almost all of these life counters feature gender swapped versions on the characters on the flip side. And this is also where those character counters come in. They feature the same gender swap images. Note the actual gender swapped hero cards aren't included here. These were offered as promo cards at adventure events and tournaments and should also be available through Studio 2. Ironically, my copies of these cards showed up today. <laughs> I haven't even opened the package yet, though. Bravo for offering a variety of genders to play, even with the same character, but a bit confusing to have things spread out among different expansions the way they are. Well, it's not actually expansions. So these gender swap hero cards are promos. So these are the kind of things you get by taking part in public play events or going to an organized play event or going to a con. It's not like you can buy a gender swap box set or that say the forest of life comes with a gender swap hero one. These are actually promos you had to earn, I guess, is the way they put it. Now, another thing I do want to note, this expansion is 100% multilingual. All of the components here are language independent, except for the instructions, which are a two-sided slip of paper that is in German and English. And even the box cover presents the name of the expansion, Wheel of Life, as Rad de Lieben in German underneath. So what is all this new stuff used for in a game of Aventuria? So the main purpose of the Wheel of Life expansion for Aventuria is to provide you with an alternative to using cards to track your health during the game. Using these wheels to assemble, uh, assemble it for the hero of your choice, picking whichever artwork you want to use, set the dial to the appropriate starting life, and adjust during play. There are enough screws in the box you can actually assemble all 11 wheels. You don't have to keep swapping up which ones. You can just build them all and put them somewhere. And uh, which is a big help in not having to worry about bumping your Euchre-style health tracking cards mm -hmm. and forgetting what your health was. The amusing thing I found about this expansion is the fact that as far as I can tell, the first printing of Aventuria used these, and then they went to the cards, and then people gave them a bunch of negative feedback about the cards, so they put out this expansion. I don't know exactly what went there. I think this only happened mainly in the German version, but like the Forest of uh, No Return expansion comes with a new character that has a wheel instead of a card. So there was some back and forth with this at some point. 
Now, the new character tokens are used to replace the tokens you already own when playing a gender swapped version of the character. There's nothing new to see here. Like, the, the, it's not a new piece, but it is new art for existing pieces. Well, of course, if you don't have the expansion with the gender swap cards, it's only of questionable value. Although you can at least have a gender swap token and wheel, so you can kind of do it part way. Now, the dragon token is the last thing. So this is a small expansion that can be used in any of your games of Venturia, both during a duel or a cooperative adventure. Now, what the dragon token does is it replaces one of the fate tokens in your game starts in the center of the table with the other fate tokens and whenever a player earns a fate token they can instead take the dragon token now the dragon token can be spent at any time to make an opponent re-roll a rope when spent it goes back to the center of the table just like a fate token note though the dragon token doesn't count as a fate token for cards and rules it's not counted when determining the target of an attack or for any other ability that would affect the fate pool like the orc shaman we complained about in a previous episode who removed fate tokens from the game so now does it so but it does replace one of the initial counts so you don't get yes. your two pl two per player plus a dragon it's yes. two per player minus one at a dragon that's correct. You swap out one of the existing fate tokens for the dragon token. Well, it's a fun little upgrade. You can have some uh, real game impact. What are your overall thoughts on this expansion? Is the Wheel of Life worth picking up for fans of Aventuria? So there's nothing included in Wheel of Life that you need to have. This expansion isn't a must-have expansion. It's not one of those cases where the game feels incomplete without it. But it is kind of nice to have. If you don't mind tracking health with cards, I didn't mind it. And I got to say, in all the games we played, which is a significant amount not now, I think I bumped my cards maybe once, maybe twice. That said, with the wheels, you don't have to worry about bumping at all. And I do dig the fact Ulysses Spiel put out gender swap versions of most, if not all, the heroes. Representation in games matters. I do wish they had included the hero cards as well. I think that's a, that's a miss on their part by not giving you everything you need in one box to swap those up. Now, if you already own the promo cards, you're going to have more of a reason to want to pick this expansion up than those who don't. Indeed. I think that's where this becomes really valuable is if you already have that additional cards and want the tokens especially to go yeah. with. Now, the Dragon Toast expansion, I got to say, is cool. I like it. It's a welcome addition to the game. Now, again, I don't feel you need it. I don't think uh, Aventuria is a million times better when you use the Dragon Token. No, it's just kind of neat. It's cool. It does add a little bit more player control over the game. It gives you a new option. Being able to force opponents to reroll instead of fate normally, you can only affect your own rules. So I think that's cool. Since getting this expansion, we have used the Dragon Token in every game we played except playing on Tabletop Simulator where it doesn't exist. So we dig it. I, I appreciate having this. So looking at those two things, well, I guess three with the gender swap thing. The problem with this box to me is the price. Like, I get it. It can't be free. It can't be, and, and there's plastic screws, right? Like those have got to be more expensive to make the little snap together thing. And there is quite a bit of cardboard in here and it's got a nice linen finish. And I realize that that has to be relatively expensive to make. But for a nice to have expansion with nothing that felt completely necessary, almost 25 bucks seems a bit high to me. Now, if you already have the gender swap cards, I could more easily justify 25 bucks. Yeah, there isn't a lot in this box at that price. You'd have yeah. to really dislike the using cards for your health to not at least wince a little bit at the, uh, the price for replacing them. Now, I do have to say, if you're a huge Aventuria fan and you just want all the stuff, grab it like it's not bad there's nothing wrong with this expansion there's no reason not to pick it up except that price now if you are playing with the gender swapped hero cards and you want your character tokens and life wheels to also match i think that's a very solid reason for picking up this expansion if you can't stand tracking health on cards and you're constantly bumping them or hitting with your sleeves or whatever in case you may be you have a cat that runs across your game table you might be able to justify the cost of this just to eliminate that potential problem for the rest of us, though, it's going to depend on your gaming budget. And I do strongly recommend every gamer have an actual gaming budget. If you dig Adventure and you got the budget for it, it's there, pick it up. 
you get an improved way to track health, you get some new gender options, and you get a cool little expansion. But if your budget isn't that high and you're, you're limited in what you can buy every month or what, every week or every year, whatever, however you have it set up, I would save up five more bucks and pick up an actual expansion with more bang for the buck, like Forest or No Return. That is the first adventure expansion for Aventuria that gives you two short missions, three long, one three act mission and a new character, all for $5 more than this expansion. So I honestly think that's a better choice if you're just looking to expand from the base set. And if you're really into dueling, well, it does cost more. Arsenal Heroes is going to be an expansion you'll probably be more interested in. That's one we reviewed and you can read about on our blog. Well, that's it for our look at Aventuria Wheel of Life. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section over the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Last week, honestly, was a great week gaming-wise. Uh, due to the loosening of restrictions here in Ontario, we were finally able to get together with the extended family and get a couple higher player count games to the table and not games that I had to play with the kids necessarily, which was kind of awesome. Also, Deanna and I played multiple rounds of a board game expansion, and I've been playing a flicking game with the kids. Well, I had hopes to get Valeria to the table, and I did reread the rules. Life gets in the way aside from that uh we have ended our run of masks and are moving on to a hacked version of a new game that's still on kickstarter uh akabo jumping in on the ground floor <laughs> i've done i've done some prototyping and i did some D, &D next but not while well, something's still live on kickstarter so that's cool so before I get to the in-person games, I do want to have a quick comment about Hardback on Board Game Arena because I kind of tore that game apart a bit. Uh, now that we've finished two full games, I am digging it. Um, it took a bit to get used to. Um, I actually now like the interface, the, the play with my cards. I get now that I know what they, when I done my turn, I should keep playing for a bit and rearrange my stuff. I like the interface. Um, I do dig up the scripting because... It doesn't make you forget things. So one of the problems we had with hardback in real life is it's fiddly. Uh, trying to remember for every coin you don't spend, you take an ink and trying to track your ink and trying to the, the, the promotions where you can spend money to get points, but only the most money you spent to get points for the entire game counts and how you can, when you hit certain milestones for getting so many um, stars in a game, you get a reward and like remembering all that. BGA takes care of all that. So that's awesome. I really do appreciate that that it, it catches the stuff that I've often missed while playing in person. I got to say this, I'd strongly recommend this hardback on BGA works really well. I still need to sit down and read the rules as I feel <laughs> like I'm missing something, but the game itself is really well designed on BGA. Yeah, you're doing way better in our second game and even our third. Now I, I decided to go all money in our latest game and uh, I see your points going up in my not. And I'm thinking that was a bad job. I'm like, what's one, two or three points at the beginning of the game. We'll just ditch all those cards. We'll just keep the money cards and buy bait. It's not working out. We'll see as a long-term strategy. Maybe it'll work. Next up, get into the physical games. Deanna and I decided to dive into emergence of shy Pluto. This is an expansion for space base. No, I am not going to spoil anything. You don't have to turn away. You don't have to mute us. I'm not going to spoil anything this time. I shouldn't say this time. I didn't spoil anything on Sunday either. So what I want to point out is some stuff that people may not realize about this expansion. At least this is stuff I didn't know about this expansion. And first up is that it's a legacy expansion. Well, nowhere in the name, it doesn't say Shy Pluto Legacy or anything like that. It didn't throw that keyword in there. It does say story expansion on the box, but that's the only thing to tell you that. It's a story-driven expansion that features two sealed boxes and two decks of cards that you're not meant to shuffle or go through. They have lots of stop symbols on them. When starting the game, all you read are the first seven pages of the rule book, flip over the first story deck card. Everything else is hidden you don't know. So... AEG once again showing their roots as an RPG company, and given that they numbered Shy Pluto, mm -hmm. they clearly plan to really release even more content of this type as well. Which I actually look forward to. So the main thing I want to do is not spoil anything, but I'm also not ready for a full review. So at this point, Deanna and I have played four games, 
and we've got maybe a quarter of the way through the story cards. We haven't opened either of the boxes, and there is a large stack of discovery cards that maybe we've gotten through one, uh, not even one eighth of, like that, that, that stack's still significant. We've only taken off uh, 15 cards out of the entire deck at this point, I think, or it might be 18, one or the other. It's, it, there's still a lot to go. Well, it's good to know there's a lot of content there to enjoy and delve into. Now, what I will say, Shy Pluto isn't turning out to be what I expected. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me about this expansion is people don't seem to think of it as a legacy game and post spoilers all over the internet. I don't know what it is with this. This is a legacy game. Why do people feel free just talking about the Shy Pluto expansion stuff all the time? Like, oh, you're playing Space Space. Did you get this? Or, hey, did you roll this? Did you do that? And I'm like, what? What's going on? Though I got to say, the ones I did see weren't as spoilery as I thought because they didn't play out the way I expected. So it's you know this. It, it, it includes new cards, right? That's going to be obvious to everyone. That doesn't spoil anything. What I find odd is a lot of these cards are more complex and present new player options, which makes individual player turns take longer. Not even just for AP, you just have more to do. And then there's something in the game that breaks what I think is the core principle of Space Base. The core principle being every player is paying attention to every role. Everyone cares about every role. That's no longer true with Shy Pluto, which to me is a very odd choice for Meiji there. That, that is intriguing, though I suppose maybe they considered that uh, mental rest after making you work harder on your own term with some of the new cards is deserved. I don't know. You're probably still going to want to pay attention to what happened, but I don't know. It, to me, that's strange. Now, based on talking about this expansion on our Brunch with the Bellhop live show on Sunday, I will clear up a few things that were mentioned the other time. So first off, this is a legacy story expansion with stuff you unlock. No, you don't need the same players for every session or even the same player count. Maybe this is the why people don't think of it as a legacy game. Though anyone joining in may want to go back and read through the story cards to see what they missed, it's not necessary. Now, as you unlock things, they are added to the base game and are expected to be part of your games of Space Base going forward. That said, the new cards are marked, so you could theoretically take them out. Now, with what we played so far, I don't see any reason to do this. Even if I was teaching the game to new players, I would probably take my game where it is now with, with Pluto on pause and just teach it, and when new stuff comes up, explaining what they are. Now, the game itself suggests ripping up cards. It literally tells you to do that. So again, it's a legacy game, though this isn't necessary. And if you don't rip anything, you can reset the expansion and play through it a second time, play it with new people, pass it on to another group, whatever. Now, the more players you play with, the quicker you are going to get through Shy Pluto. Progression, at least so far that we've seen, is based on rolling certain numbers or buying certain cards. And while the more players you have, the more odds those cards will get bought, and well, the odds those numbers will come up will increase. Overall, we're liking the changes so far. The story is kind of neat. I do like that there's a story and things progress. It gives it, it a story feel, right? It feels it's, it's definitely helps put the theme back into space space. But it is leading to longer games, significantly longer games. And this could be a bad thing. Now, no, we're still only partway through. Maybe that'll change. Maybe we'll hit something like the um, oh, what's it, Prelude expansion for Terraforming Mars somehow added into space space to kind of speed things up. Because like I said, I'm nowhere near final thoughts yet. But we're not going to review this until I finish the entire thing. This is many legacy games you can review partway through. Like no one needs to finish Gloomhaven to talk about Gloomhaven. In this case, I really do think we need to flip that final card before I share my final thoughts. Well, we'll all be looking forward to that review. And if nothing else, we can get some uh, possible tabletop simulator games of it in along the way. Yeah, we do need to play that at some point. We need to sit down. We just need more time in the day, all days. Yep. Can we get the four day work week thing that worked yeah. in Sweden and somehow apply that to content creators? <laughs> like, you know, weekends, can we get those back at some point? So next up, we got on a four player game of trap words with Deanna and I teaming up against her mom and sister. Uh, this is a word-based party game from Ch CGE Check Games Edition that combines word guessing with a dungeon crawl theme. It reminds me of some other popular mass market word games that tend to be like, don't say the wrong word, but the theme really makes this one stand out. 
Now, the reason we hadn't played this before is due to the fact it's a team game. It requires four players, and that was something we couldn't do until this last weekend. Thanks to vaccination rates rising fast, we're getting to a much better place yes. for that sort of thing now, at least around here. And it doesn't look like, because so many people are getting vaccinated, it doesn't look like the Delta is going to ruin that, at least in Ontario. But you never know. Fingers crossed. So here's a super quick summary, not even a full detailed thing. So you're building a dungeon out of tiles. Each dungeon room has a number. Your adventuring party start in the lowest number tile, and a randomly generated monster starts at the other end. Each round, players get a random word. They get the word, and they're going to end up giving that to the opponent's team. But before doing that, you're going to write down a number of trap words based on the room number. So if you're in room three, you're going to write down three trap words. If you're deep in the dungeon in room seven, you're going to write down seven trap words. You write these words down on a sheet of paper, then you pass the word to the clue giver on the opponent's team, which rotates every turn. They're, they're the torch bearer. They get a little torch token. Then that clue giver starts giving out clues, trying to get their team to guess the word that's in this little book they've got. Now, the team only gets five guesses, but the clue giver can give any number of clues. And these clues can be long sentences. They don't have to be cup, black. You could be like, the mug Mo uses on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, technically, you're not allowed to use proper nouns, so that wouldn't work. But it, it would have to be something like, like that, right? Like, you can say it full words. Now, the whole thing is, the other team's paying attention while you're doing this. They have a timer for one thing. You only have so much time. But if the clue giver, and only the clue giver, says any of the words you wrote down as trap words, you just say, you hit a trap, and the team stops right then. They lose. If they don't hit a trap, they consider they've won that round. So it sounds interesting. It just, it really doesn't sound very dungeon-y. Um, is, it, is it a pasted on theme or is it, do you so, feel it in the integration? Somewhat, like it's, it's, it's better than no theme. Um, the one thing they did do that is kind of cute is there are, the, I, I'm saying books, but they're these cardboard folded things that go over your, right. over your cards that actually make it so that every card can be read eight different ways, depending on which book it's in and which side's up. Or actually, it'd be 16 different ways, because then there's they're all two-sided cards. Two of the books in the game are dungeon theme, fantasy theme. So the words are going to be goblin, wizard, guard, soldier, longsword. The other books will give you bus, hippopotamus, pie. So they did throw in fantasy themed, and it's your choice at the start of the game which to play with, or you can switch back and forth. We did play with the fantasy theme. Um, then there are kind of things like the torchbearer is the leader. So they're the clue giver. They're the ones that are supposed to be in the lead. Um, what does add to it, and I can't remember if I mentioned this a little bit or not, is after the first room, you start putting out um, curses. And the first person to enter a room is cursed. And this is a way, it's a catch-up mechanic. So if your team's in the lead, you're going to deal with the curses. And the curses make it more difficult in different ways um one of them was the clue giver can only give one word clues um i'm just, the the team can only get three guesses instead of five or or so on there were things to impede you um one of them was the clue giver once the team guesses once the clue giver can no longer give out clues that was petrification so there are these these kind of dungeon theme and and they're all named plus you're also fighting a boss monster, which is randomized, and the boss monster is a fantasy. So there's a dragon, there's a vampire, there's a mummy. But yes, it's it's mostly pasted on, except by using the dungeon words. At least then you get some more of that theme. Okay, that's fair. Now, if you win your round, your team goes deeper into the dungeon. What's important here is, again, the number is going to go up. So the amount of trap words keeps increases. So the I guess this is thematic. The deeper you get in the dungeon, the more traps you can set. Now, if both teams fail, the monster moves forward, which is neat because it makes a timing mechanic. Even if everyone just keeps failing, you're going to get to the monster. Now, once you enter the monster, you're considered to be in a boss fight. Each monster has different restrictions. So in our game, it was a dragon, and you only got three guesses every round instead of five. And if you manage to defeat the dragon, you win. Now, there are low-level and high-level versions of each monster, and the high-level version of the dragon is you only get one guess. And there are others. Uh, the one that sounded the most fun is the mummy curses you and you draw one of those curse turns every round. Every round you fight the mummy, you face a different curse, which again, it, it's got that theme in there. Now, if a team does defeat the boss monster, they win. If 
both teams defeat the boss monster at once. They 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 tie in. There is a mechanic for breaking that if you don't want to do the shared tie. But if neither team is defeated before eight rounds are up, the monster devours you both. Your whole team's been eaten. Now there is more to it. Uh, like I said, I kind of mentioned the 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 curse cards that the first time you enter into it, and there are really detailed rules about which clues are valid and what trap words can be used, like. If you say, if you put the, the science as a trap word, that applies to science, scientist, sci-fi are all trap words for science and even parts of a word. So like one of the rounds we were playing the trap word, it was um, visions was what we were trying to get or prophecy. It was prophecy or visions. And Deanna wrote down crystal ball. And I'm like, no, we just had to put ball. Because if they say crystal ball, they say ball and they might say something else with ball in it. And then we'll get the trap word off. All right. Well, it's certainly interesting to say the least. I don't know. I'd have to, I have to give it a try, but uh, we'll wait for uh, group playback for that. Yeah. This is one. I, I don't think it would work well online. I, it might, you'd need two copies of the game. No, cause you have to pass the word. So I don't even know. I don't know if it could be done unless someone's done a digital version. But at this point we played once, right? Like I, I can't say too much about it. Uh, it was solid. It, it was, it was a good game. Um, my mother-in-law loved it, which actually we thought she probably would. So she really dug it. Even though she was having a hard time at the first, she just kept wanting to give one word clues because so many of these guessing games, that's what you do is you just keep saying one word clues until your other team gets it. Whereas being able to say long sentences like object used to see visions because you don't want to say crystal ball. Like that's the kind of clues you actually want to give are these longer ones. So getting into that mindset did take a bit. Um, I, the thing is, I couldn't help but compare it to Letter Jam because both games showed up on the same day. They're both from Czech Games Edition and they're both letter ba word based party games. And we reviewed that way back. So if you want to hear my thoughts on Letter Jam, check out that episode, check out the blog, check out YouTube. They're all there. Um, now, we haven't gotten to share that with the extended family, but Deanna and I both preferred Letter Jam. Now, at some point, I want to let Holly and Brenda try that one, too, so they can compare. Um, but right now, it's like the pile of obligation. I'll be getting to this in five, in, in, in we can, I, I, I'm like, I want to show off all the games, but then I have games I need to review. So it's, it's, it's a mess on what we're going to play next. But I would like to hear their thoughts on both of them. Yeah, I, I am going to try this a couple more times before I do a full review. There isn't really like, I don't see a reason I need to try the higher level monsters, but I should play a game with the non-fantasy theme and at least just get a couple more rounds in. Uh, and I know that CGE does actually have a video explaining how to play trap words with over Zoom or your video, oh, there video you go. conferencing That's... of source. So they did a bunch of these. They did code names and a bunch of different cool. game of their games during the pandemic. Uh, Letter Jam, I have played and I, I did enjoy that, uh, yeah. even if the scoring was perhaps obtuse. Yeah, the scoring in that doesn't... I don't even know why you score. <laughs> this is teams. One team wins. Right. Next up, I got another game with Holly and Brenda and Deanna, and that was Guild Wars. So just last week, I was talking about how I found this game really didn't work well with two players. And I am very pleased to say it works really well with four. Like, really well. This was really solid. All the stuff like auctions, bribing other players, rising building costs, and the prisoner's dilemma of trying to decide whether or not to cooperate when multiple teams attempt the same mission that ruined the game with playing only two worked great with four. Now, we did play the short game, which is a, an included option. You play six rounds instead of nine. And all of the possible conflicts came up once, right? We had Holly and Deanna both show up to the same mission, talk about how they're going to split up the the loot the who's going to get the card and who's going to get the stuff and they did the prisoner's dilemma thing um brenda got hosed multiple times waiting too long to hire new adventurers often putting it in her second action and by the time she got the adventurers guild it was empty um multiple times people were denied building improvements because People had gotten to the builders first and driven up demand, so they didn't have the money to buy what they wanted. Basically, all the stuff I complained about was there in its positive good way. So uh, just to point out that this is actually Guild Master, not Guild Wars, which wow, is a yeah. very different game. <laughs> yeah, it's, sorry. Guild Master from uh, Good Games Publishing. Uh, so I, again, I'm not sure if this game is really up my alley as it's, it's, it's that, again, it, it's that sort of, 
conflict driven uh, interplayer conflict driven mm. game but it is great to hear that when you get those right player counts it becomes mm -hmm. a solid enjoyable game now again we played the game properly with more than two players only once so i would like to get in at least one more game before i share any final thoughts possibly more i would say this did reinforce my feeling that it's not a game for two players but then the pr people from good games publishing decided to reach out and comment on that and say that once i learned the game and have played it with more player counts i should then go back to two because playing it with two with experienced players is very different than playing it with two. It's more of a cat and mouse game. So to give them their credit, credits due, I will try that before publishing a final review. So it's probably going to be a couple more weeks before we get to that one. I was kind of hoping to hammer it out next week, but I think we'll give it a little more time. Now, the last game I do want to mention tonight is Flicking Finches, which I reviewed last week. Um, normally like we played it more me and my kids had fun right that's all i want to say but the thing is much to my chagrin it ends up we got a pretty important rule wrong now i've gone and corrected it for the written version of the review and we're doing something so that the vod version on youtube will have a comment on top of it so you're aware but there's nothing i can do about the full episode that's out there or people who watch live or people who sub to our podcast and heard the wrong rule so i do want to make that correction here so when chirping, the bird closest to Darwin gets sketched, as I indicated, but only if it has something in common with the leftmost open sketchbook card. Then, no matter how many traits match on that bird, they take that card, they take that slot. And then only the next card can be filled. This adds a whole new level of tactics and strategy to this game that makes evolving birds much more important and much more common. Playing with the proper rules, the game was significantly more involved and a little heavier, and I got to admit it, much better. Now, it's still light family weight, but now engaging enough that my girls enjoyed it. So one of the things I complained is my girls were like, eh, it's a little too light. No, now it's not. Now it has that at just enough depth to keep them engaged. My oldest in particular loved it. Now, my youngest, I think, would also love it, but she's still a little frustrated by flicking and not being very good at it. If she had the patience to take her time and flick better, she'd probably still love the game. So I do have to apologize. I'm sorry, Miraday Games, for getting that one wrong. But I do have to say, playing by the proper rules did make what I already considered a good game even better. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? So we've already got a game night planned with Brenda and Holly for this weekend. Haven't quite decided, but I think we're going to go for another round of Guild Masters for sure. Um, possibly a bit more. I, I I don't know. Like, I I really want to get through the pile of obligation, right? It's a pile of obligation. There's games we've had shared that, that we had four players. But, like, there's these awesome games we've discovered in the last year and a half. They haven't gotten to play. Like, oh, my gosh, Holly, you're going to love Space Base. And I, but, but we already reviewed it. So maybe we can do some some shy pluto just because then i don't know so i don't know i'm fighting with myself over what we're going to get in but thankfully things aren't going to relock down and this will become a more regular thing so i don't have to feel as stressed to try to get some of the stuff reviewed yeah it's tough uh picking picking games now after this delay is is certainly a, a tough one when you've got yes. a billion things to introduce to someone and a completely separate ice uh separate list of things that you want to need to play yes and and to be honest that's the other thing too like i'm at the point now i now have enough games in the boat to go to the pile of obligation that i need to record some unboxing videos um i now have a pile of four games so i have a uh, jabuka which is a word game where you can twist the letters around i've got tapestry from stonemeyer games which I can't wait to take those components out of that box. I, it's going to feel like, like, uh, oh, what are those called? Oh, they're, they're, they're little houses you could buy. And I always wanted them for D&D. &D, and it was a my little cottage or something. And they started showing up in all the knickknack shops. And I, that's what this game looks like it has. And then they got Code Monkey from the people at Code Monkey, which is an intro programming game. And then I've got some Aventuria promo cards right here, which I don't know how much of a review these will need because I think they're only one thing. And then there's a package over here. I don't even know what it is. Like I've got two to open. I got this one right here. And then I got another one over there that's really thin. That might be another game to unbox. And then the pile of obligation grows. And I'm like, oh, now what do we play next and you know, and to be honest it's a good problem to have but the fact we have stuff to get through is awesome so 
we're looking forward to gaming with people. Um, not this week. It's going to take a little bit, but we're also talking about getting together with uh, Kat and Tori. So getting those over and we already said the the first time we're getting we're not jumping into gloomhaven or anything right away we'll we're going to show off some of our games fair enough then now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support kevin reno who can thank me for not spoiling space base shy pluto i was really close on sunday i knew i wouldn't do it here on the main show but in our in our special get together unscripted get together i was all ready to talk about all the new card powers so you're welcome kevin at some point what we'll probably do when we review it is i'll have a section where i'll, I'll talk some spoilers of like air just hit mute and we'll figure out the time <laughs> Maybe Sean could do a voiceover where he'll, this is future Sean here. We'll do that thing. And he'll say, you know, jump ahead eight minutes. You'll be good. Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. Kator, Kat and Tori. Uh, we're going to see him in person. We booked an in, uh, in game gaming night, in person gaming night with Kat and Tori on the 16th. So at that point, we will all be fully vaccinated and safe to be together and gaming again. I, I don't even know. I need to talk to them and see if there's a Cat and Tori list. Space Base is on there for sure. Make show off some Aventuria. Oh, so many great games to share with you, too. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, Mage Akela, thank you so much for your support in multiple platforms. It is greatly appreciated. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on the, your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. As always, links down below. Now, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued effort, it would be fantastic if you headed over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and tipped your bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. Stop by also Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.